resolution is this canvas. Um, so um, uh, I, this is a smaller version. I actually have some versions that are, are, are two meters by one and a half meters. Um, so the first thing to say about this is it's a tool to help you collaborate. Uh, so the reason we put it on the wall is to allow, if you imagine the co-founders of a business, uh, the existing senior management of a business, uh, perhaps with stakeholders like potential customers or employees or investors uh, or suppliers or economic development people to be with the company to explore how this works. Um, and so at its very basic level, what we've done is we've provided a common language uh, to help people have better conversations. It's really no more complex than that. Um, so let me give you a little uh, history about business modeling, uh, just to sort of set the scene and then I'll dig into this in a, a little bit more uh, detail. Um, so uh, the idea of business models uh, is actually very new. Um, the first time that we found it in the literature is in the 1950s. Uh, there was like one mention, uh, actually to do with gamification of designing businesses um, just after the Second World War. Um, and then there's almost nothing in the literature until about 1995. Uh, which is when the internet came along and everybody realized, oh my goodness, uh, we need some way to describe and think about the opportunities and challenges that this entirely new technology, communications technology, is going to bring to business. And this is where people said, well, what's going to happen is we're going to have to change our business model. That's how the term was first came up. And uh, most of the research in the, um, from the early, mid-1990s to the 2005 sort of range was almost entirely focused on um, the impact of in the sort of e-commerce space and how business models were uh, going to be impacted. Um, and at the same time, we had uh, in parallel with that, we had this idea that business is a design uh, activity, not a, an analytical activity. And so there were a small number of scholars in business schools, a tiny minority, who started to write about how do you design business. Um, and then there were all, an even smaller group of people who were going, well, not only do we have to do it, we have to design business rather than analyze and plan, uh, we also have to do it systematically with a systems thinking uh, lens. Um, and so uh, on the first of those threads, uh, business design, um, in the early 2000s, uh, some researchers in Switzerland, uh, Yves Pigneur and Alex Ostervolder, uh, did uh, a deep dive into what are the factors uh, in a business model that historically we believed lead to short-term profitability. Uh, and they came up with what's called the business model ontology, so it's a very technical artifact. And then over the following four years, uh, Oswald and Pigno uh, did a lot of work using that uh, tool with businesses and then uh, crowdfunded a book called Business Model Generation, uh, which is now sold somewhere between two and a half and three million copies worldwide. Uh, and the tool, the user tool that they came up with is called the Business Model Canvas. It has nine questions. Those questions are the questions that uh, we believe lead to short-term uh, profitability. Um, it's a fantastic tool. Uh, it's used by practically every innovation startup, um, you know, incubator and accelerator worldwide now. It's, it's very hard not to find it in use in, in those contexts. There's, lot, there's been lots of derivations of it, um, mostly focused on, um, the, it, from a startup perspective, there's been some for social enterprise, for example, um, but they all, the, most of the um, adaptations so far have been all focused on uh, the, the process of starting a business or the process of evolving the business. They've not been focused on the description of a business, which is what the original canvas was to do. It was to des describe a complete business model financially. Um, so I came along uh, in the, about 2010, um, and I looked at, uh, Oswald's original PhD, and I went, you know what, there's an assumption here that's been made in this PhD that hasn't been written down, uh, which uh, is kind of concerning when you come across scientific work where there's an unstated assumption. Uh, and so I said, um, the assumption that's been made here um, is that the only thing that the user of this tool is interested in is short-term profitability. Uh, what if I'm an entrepreneur who actually cares about how that profit arises, and what my impacts might be, or what risks there might be, or what opportunities there might be if I take a slightly larger lens of thinking about the business in its full context. So, yes, economic, but also social and environmental. 
and it was that change in assumption that has ultimately led us to the flourishing business canvas. So let me walk you through uh, quickly uh, how that assumption works out in practice. Uh, so the first thing you see is that there are three containing contexts for everything else that's on the canvas. So the first is environment. So this is, uh, as you can see, it contains everything. Guess what? That's just like reality. It contains everything, the environment. Uh, and uh, so this, by putting this straight on here as a business tool is to remind everybody that this is a reality. And if you want to ignore that reality, of course, you're free to do so, but we don't think that's a very smart business choice. Uh, and increasingly, as the feedback loops from our past activities where we did ignore it are coming back to uh, haunt us, uh, it, we think it's increasingly important that business pays attention to their ultimate context from a risk perspective, but also from an opportunity perspective. Um, so we think there's more opportunity than there is risk, in fact. Is, uh, uh, but you have to first acknowledge where the opportunity and risk potential might come from. Uh, second is society. So, of course, society is within the environment. Uh, and uh, this is the, the, the human dimension. And, of course, there's many parts of our world as humans that have no economic connection. Um, and this is inside. So this is, uh, imagine this is three-dimensional now, if you like, that the society is inside the environment. And then, of course, the economy as well. The economy is something that society has created in order to help people in society better meet their needs than they could by themselves. And, of course, increasingly, large, larger and larger parts of how we meet our needs from everything from uh, f food and transportation and even love and relationships now, uh, all the dating apps are now being provided through an economic, organisational uh, lens. Um, and so uh, this is the nest. Um, so... Society creates the economy, society is inside the environment, and of course the economy is inside the environment as well. This is a complete uh, nest. So then uh, the next challenge is, uh, as I mentioned, the economic factors, there's nine of them. Uh, Alex Osterwald and Eve Pigneau did a fantastic job uh, from the research that I then did. Um, that There are a few minor niggles, but basically they got it 100% correct. So their nine questions are still here. The challenge is when you put those nine questions into these three contexts, you realise that actually they oversimplified reality. And this is, of course, the dangerous oversimplification. Uh, and so a lot of people say, well, can't you make it simpler? And part of me wants to say, I really would love to make it simpler, but that's actually what's got us into the mess we're in there. Um, and that's what's allowing us to miss opportunities. So uh, we're going to try and make this as straightforward as possible, uh, but we're certainly not going to oversimplify, because that's, in fact, what's led us into the trouble we've got ourselves into. Yeah, I would, I would say it's too simple, but that's just me. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, it, so the ontology, of course, is the more complex yeah. thing underneath it. So the ontology has just over 30 boxes. Mm. Uh, we're down to 16 questions here. So uh, let me dive into that. So we have 16 questions, not nine. All the nine are still here. Um, so, for example, one of the nine questions is, who is your customer? It's a critical question for business. We've still got that here, but we ask stakeholder, which is including customers. So we just ask a slightly larger question. Because, of course, when you ask the question in, in, of, of customer inside economy, society, and environment, you realise, well, maybe there's other people we need to think about, design into the business model. So we've got 16 questions. 16 is too many for most people. Most people can handle between five and nine things at any one time. Uh, so as tool designers, we wondered, well, what should we do about that? So our current idea, uh, and this is a development version. Uh, we're at version 2 at the moment. We are going to release a version 2.1. Uh, early next year, and then when we go public with the book, uh, it'll be version 3, we suspect. Um, and this will be released under a Creative Commons license with no restriction on it. So uh, ultimately, uh, it will be free and available for everybody to use. At the moment, uh, it is free to use, but you do have to license, get a license for it, because we want to know who's using it to get feedback so we can make it better. Um, and so it's, this is the version that's licensed to have that uh, at the university. So uh, what we did to simplify to, or to, to uh, make it easier to use is we grouped the 16 questions into four perspectives. So the first perspective is outcomes. So outcomes, uh, and I'll come back to the questions in a moment. So this is all about why. Why you're doing what you're doing and whether or not you've actually managed to do it. Uh, so goals is kind of the, the why angle. The next is the who question. Who's involved? So this is the people perspective and there's... Uh, uh, five questions in that perspective. The next is the what perspective. What do you do? So this is all about how do you create the value that you're going to create, what value you're going to co-create. And then the last perspective is the where perspective and the how perspective. 
So again, one of the interesting things is, of course, when you put these questions into these contexts, uh, where you do things suddenly matters. So for a, a region of Haram, this is kind of important that people actually recognize they are here, right? They're not somewhere else. Uh, and, uh, you know, last time I checked, uh, you know, I slept in a bed uh, in a place uh, and I ate food that was grown in a field. And that's not going to change, uh, despite what people in Silicon Valley might have us believe, that everything's going to somehow magically become virtual. It's not going to happen, right? There's going to be quite a lot of things that will remain very much rooted in place. And of course, this comes back to culture, uh, which is obviously a big societal handle. So this really gets to the focus on the how and the, and the where. So within those four perspectives, within the three contexts, we then have the 16 questions. Um, so rather than going through these in detail, I thought I'd give you a little, uh, very quick case study to illustrate how this works. So these, are, these questions are the language, if you like, they're the nouns of the language. And then as a group, what this, uh, if you're working with a, as entrepreneurs or other stakeholders in an existing business, what this does is, it means you can have a conversation about your business model without having to invent this language first. It's here. You just have to use it. So how do you use it? So the process is, if, if we're in a discussion, uh, and we want to describe an existing business model, uh, we, are, we basically take each of these nouns, we turn it into a question. So, who are your stakeholders? What needs do they have? What value do we co-create for them? And what activities do we perform to co-create that value with our stakeholders to meet their needs? So you can see how I've dropped the verbs in now to connect the nouns together. So uh, let me give you an example of business. So this is a, a business in Toronto. Uh, it's based on a, a, an East Asian um, uh, paradigm uh, for lunchtime delivery of food. Uh, so this is using uh, stainless steel containers called tiffins. Uh, and this is uh, something from Mumbai originally, uh, where the food is cooked in, uh, at home, and then it's delivered to people in their offices through a bicycle network. So in this case, it's the company doing the cooking, but they deliver it to your desk in your office tower in the center of Toronto in the financial district. So, uh, who are our customers? Well, it turns out our customers are young, single men. So, there's our customers, young, single men. Um, and uh, what, what need do they have? They have a need for sustenance. They have a need to eat. And why do they buy from us? what causes them to come to Tiffin Day uh, for delivery. So there's two reasons. Uh, the first is it's good food, tastes good. Uh, and the second reason is it's really convenient because I go online, I enter the order online, and magically the food appears at my desk. I mean, it's pretty, pretty amazing. And um, so then how do, how do, we, uh, how do we do this? Uh, so uh, this is uh, vegan food, uh, so it's all plants. So the biophysical stocks that we're drawing on are plants. Um, and uh, this obviously becomes our ingredients in our recipes. That's the resource here. Uh, but the other thing we need is recipes, intellectual property. Um, and then, of course, we have to make and deliver the food. making delivery and of course these people pay us so this gives us revenue in terms of uh, I'll put euros on here and uh, costs obviously we've got uh, the cost of the food and the cost of the kitchen and of the staff again put that up there now you'll notice when I put these up I've put them in the economic part of cost so you see that cost, you can have a cost economically, measured in money, you can have a cost socially, how much unhappiness did I create? Uh, and then you can have a cost for that, uh, environmentally, so how many tons of carbon dioxide did I emit? That would be a, a, an environmental cost. And we, we recommend you don't convert those into money. Some people try and convert those into money, that's the triple bottom line idea, you convert everything to money. We, we suggest it's better just to leave these in units that are non-monetary. So, so far, this is all very conventional. Really? I've not done anything remarkable here uh, at all. Um, but why does this business exist? This business exists um, in order to create time for the owner to be a mother. She's a single mother and she wants time to be a mother. So this is the goal of the business. Uh, but there's a second 
reason that this business was created by the founder Seema Pabari. Um, and that is that she wanted to build on her culture. So she's from Southeast Asia, she wanted to build on her culture and help uh, her community somehow with the business. So build on culture, help community. This is where I'm going to write on my shirt after the end, if I'm not careful. Um, okay, so, uh, so another stakeholder of the business is actually Seema herself and her son because they're stakeholders of this business, because if the business doesn't work, Seema won't have time to be with her son. The stakeholder in Swedish. Um, and uh, she won't have time to, to be with her son, and of course they won't have the financial means, so I should say that another goal is to be sufficiently profitable. Now, of course, that's the, that's the goal that's assumed in earlier tools. There isn't even a goal box on the earlier talks because everyone is assuming that the only reason you're in business is to be profitable, right? Whereas here, you can have many reasons. Um, and of course, some of these reasons are going to be just purely economic, but some of them could be social and environmental. But they'll also have an economic dimension to them. So you know, when we put a sticker in the economic, it doesn't mean it does not have social and environmental. It means it has an economic as well as a social and environmental. And it's up to you to decide on the interpretation uh, for this. So Seema and our stakeholders. Um, so uh, she said, OK, I, what I'm going to do is all these recipes are going to be from Southeast Asia. Because guess what? My mum taught me them when I was growing up. That's her IP. So she's using something that she already had inside her. And then she said, well, who can I get to help me cook this? She said, well, it's obvious it's going to be other people from my culture because they also know all the recipes. Um, so she said, okay, so an ecosystem actor for her is going to be Southeast Asian um, people. And then she said, okay, well, what's... This is interesting because a lot of people who arrive in Canada from Southeast Asia um, find it very difficult to get work um, because there's all kinds of employment barriers. So um, she, and then she realized, oh, hang on a second, a lot of those people are in the same situation she was, that they have childcare responsibilities, they have to drop their kids off at school in the morning, they have to pick them up in the evening. Um, so maybe I should only operate at lunchtime and then I could hire those people because they could arrive after they've dropped the kids off at school and they could go home before uh, the, they have to pick the kids up. So that's who she hired. She hired um, other Southeast Asian women, and she trained them. Um, she, she got them uh, food handling certificates. So she trained them, and she got them certif uh, certificates. So they built up the uh, uh, cap capacity of the whole economy, really, because we're adding now people who are trained in food preparation. Um, and they already know the recipes, so that actually lowers her costs of, of training. And of course they love the food, and so they're actually living their culture in their work, which of course is helping to build community. So I'll stop at that point, this business model goes on quite a bit more. Uh, in a, when you do this work at a detailed level, sometimes you end up with 60 stickies, sometimes 100 stickies. Um, when you're presenting it in a group like this, like how many have I ended up with here? 20 stickies maybe here? Um, so you simplify, you use it for storytelling, which is what I've just done with you. It's a storytelling tool, and that's what the students did yesterday, very, very effectively. Um, and um, as you can see, I've explained something really quite complex here, but yet you've got, now got at least an intuitive feel for how it works. And part of that is because I didn't have to, you could, when I placed the sticky on here, you saw how it was related to the box. And you intuit it from your knowledge of what these words mean, because most of these words are roughly common words. Yes, they have very technical meanings which we could get into, but you don't need that in order to be able to start to use it. So it's a very approachable uh, uh, tool. So that's a, a quick introduction to the Flourishing Business Canvas.